ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في الكتاب الكريم بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال عز وجل يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we begin by praising him by glorifying him and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send us peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower this gathering with his mercy and forgiveness. <coughs> Alhamdulillah, we always start with the reminder of verses of taqwa. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, O people of iman, ittaqu Allah haqqa tuqatih. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he deserves to be feared. Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is due to him, as is his right. And one of the scholars explaining what that really means, he gave an example of a person driving in the street. He said a person will be speeding, he will be running stoplights and everything, <coughs> until he notices a police officer. When you see the police officer, what happens? The behavior changes. Suddenly they're the law-abiding citizen, they're stopping three seconds exactly at every red light and Mashallah, you know, very good driver. And so similarly, when we realize the presence of authority, the presence of the power, the one that is in charge of all the universe, when we recognize that presence, our behavior should be impacted. We should have a type of consciousness and awareness that will change the way that we behave in this world. And that is what it means to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is due to Him. To recognize that He's looking at me, so how should I be? وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّا إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And if we forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then just remember this, just don't die except in a state of Islam. One person came to a shaykh and said, Ya shaykh, I have a lot of sins, I can't stop, I don't know what to do. Shaykh said, okay, I have an idea, why don't you go sin in a place where Allah is not looking at you? That way you don't have a problem. He said, Ya shaykh, what are you saying? Wherever I go, Allah can see me. He said, okay, fine. In that case, go and do your sins in a place which doesn't belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Find yourself a corner that doesn't belong to Allah, use something that doesn't belong to Allah, and do whatever you want. He said, everything belongs to Allah. The, the skies belong to Allah, the earth belongs, where am I going to go? The moon, it belongs to Allah. The, the Mars, it belongs to Allah too. Next galaxy over, also belongs to Allah. He said, I can't find a place that doesn't belong to Allah. I said, okay, no problem. If knowing that Allah is looking at you doesn't stop you, knowing that everything you're using to sin doesn't stop you, then you know when the angel of death comes to take your soul, just tell the angel of death, wait 10 minutes, let me make my tawbah, and then let me go. Or, or make an appointment with him, so that you know it's convenient, you can pray, and you make your tawbah, everything, and then the angel of death can come and take you. He said, yes, yes, the angel of death shows up unannounced. It's not up to me when he comes, it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, oh, okay, if you don't even know when you're going to die, it can happen at any moment. And that doesn't stop you. Knowing that everything you're using to sin belongs to Allah doesn't stop you. Knowing that Allah is looking at you doesn't stop you. Then on the day of judgment, when the angels grab you and Allah tells them to throw this man into hellfire and they're about to throw you, just tell them, look man, you got the wrong person, I'm going to Jannah, okay? That's my home. He said, how can I turn away the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When the, Allah commanded the angels to throw me into hellfire, the angels will not let me walk away. You know, it's, security is tight on that day. Nobody can slip through the cracks. He said, okay, if you're going to be that helpless on that day, then recognize you're helpless today. And seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, His mercy and His help, and ask Him to give you a good ending. No matter what happens now, this is between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most important <coughs> moment is the last moment. How are we going to leave this world? Are we going to be in a state of oppressive, you know, oppression? Are we going to be in a state of, you know, sinning, disobedience? Or are we going to be in a state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that moment could be any day. In the other ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah wa qulu qawlan sadeedah. 
O people of Iman, have taqwa of Allah, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and speak good words. Yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. If you just take care of your responsibility, don't say something that is offensive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't say something that is hurtful to the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, I will take care of all of your affairs for you. Whatever problem you have going on, I will manage it for you. Who will manage our problems? The one who created the skies. The one who created the earth. He's promising, I'm going to take care of your problems. You just take care of your tongue. <laughs> On top of that, I'm going to forgive you your sins. <coughs> it's a good deal. <laughs> Whoever obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeys His Messenger, they have attained the greatest success. Now why we have these reminders every single week? Because as human beings, we forget. We walk out of the Jummah and we start yelling at people. You know, look at this guy. Doesn't he know how to park his car? He blocked me and we go off. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qulu khawlan sadida. We remember that we have to keep this in mind. Now as for today's subject, I was really thinking about what am I going to talk about. And subhanAllah, this morning my wife woke up and she said, I had this dream, I saw something. I said, khalas, that's the subject. That's what we're going to talk about. So, you might be wondering what it is. Going through this world, going through this life, <coughs> one of the things that we notice in our time is our deen and our iman is under attack from all different angles. And Rasulullah he would describe to the Sahaba some of the things that we would see on this day and age. The Sahaba couldn't even fathom what, what, what the Prophet was describing. For example, he said, وسلم, people will go on the marketplace with their thighs exposed. And the Sahaba were like, what? Thais, Ya Rasulullah, how can they leave their homes like this? They could not imagine this happening. People would walk around on the streets and you could see their thighs. This was like unheard of. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that <coughs> fitan will be all around them. The temptations and the desires will be presented to people like on a reed mat. Odan, Odan. It's like weaved, like, like weaved together like a reed mat. Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu was describing, you know what a reed mat looks like? <coughs> When we used to live in Pakistan, they used to have beds made out of this thing. It's like sticks, you weave them together. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's like a mat. You can make a carpet out of it, you can make things out of it. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said, it will be like a mat, weaved together, like a reed mat, and it will display to people, fitan, fitan. It will display to people temptations, desires, things like that. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for the hearts that drink it up, it will display it to the hearts of the people. Some hearts will drink it up, and that heart will turn black. He said, and the heart that rejects it will have a white dot placed upon it and Allah will protect it. He said, as for the heart that turns black, it will become such that it will not be able to tell the difference between what is good and what's bad. Everything will be okay for them. And as for the heart that is, that is rejecting it, he said, they will be saved and their religion will be saved. And so the scholar is talking about, contemporary scholar said, you know what Allah is talking about, what the Prophet was describing? Read mat that displays things to people, all the pixel-based display systems, if you zoom into your TV screen, for example, or you zoom into your phone screen, if you really look at how every single pixel is formed, it's got three colors, green, red, and blue. And they're all next to each other, and if you look at it, it and put a picture of a reed mat next to it, it's the same exact shape, same exact thing. And the Prophet ﷺ said, fitan will be shown, displayed to people. And these display devices, now it's everywhere, in your pockets, Somebody, now we don't even have to be with somebody to make ghibah. It used to be, you cannot backbite if you're alone. We're living in a time, somebody could be sitting by himself, and he will do backbiting, and he will do namima, and all kinds of sins that requires other people. So, we're living in a time, the Prophet ﷺ was describing, that was, the, the, the Sahaba couldn't imagine. And so our, our iman, our deen, is under attack from many different sides. And, one of the things Rasulullah was talking about that is praised in the Quran also, the quality of a believer is self-restraint. Especially more important in this day and age than any other time. Self-restraint is one quality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised in the Quran. And it's one quality that is going to be of use in this day and age. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسِ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ 
Whoever fears the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever fears the, the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they're able to say no to themselves when desires come to them, when temptations <coughs> come to them, when, they're, you know, when they're, their heart is stirred up with whims and all of these things, if they can say no to themselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that person, their place of abode is in Jannah. Rasul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ فَلَهُ جَنَّتَانِ Whoever fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and prevents from doing things that their desires are pushing them to do, Allah says they have two jannas. Why two jannas? Some of the scholars said the reason for that is because every single person Allah created. Allah gave us a home in jannah. So you have a place in jannah that's got your name on it. The paperwork, the title, deed, everything is done. Boom, it's yours. It's in jannah. But you know what? There are people who are able to say no and hold themselves back. They will make it to Jannah, but there are people who cannot say no. And when a desire comes, when temptation comes, they just fall right over and they follow it through. And they will not make it to Jannah. So their homes are sitting empty. So you know what happens? The people that made it, they start to inherit the Jannahs of the people that didn't make it. They have two Jannahs now. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing, and I was thinking about this subhanAllah, uh, on, as I was driving, I was... Not, I wasn't really thinking about this, but I was thinking of this memory many years ago. A group of my friends and Sheikh Abdul Rafa, my teacher, we decided to go to revive one of the sunnas. It was about to be Ramadan time. We wanted to go do moon sighting so we can see the new moon born with our own eyes. And so we went to Skyland Drive. Who's been to Skyland Drive? Beautiful place, right? MashaAllah. Yes. So we went there. We parked at one of the overlooks. And... We went downhill to one of those places where we could sit and have a clear view of the sunset. And I remember this one friend that was with us, he was a joker. He was always playing around, messing with people. Well, all of us came down, he stayed in the car. After some time, he came down. And I'm standing down there, I'm looking, and I see, turn around, I see behind me, he's running down the hill. And he's laughing. <laughs> he's coming down like this. And I thought maybe he's just joking around, he's trying to like scare me, I'm going to bump into you or something. So I moved out of his way. I moved out of his way and the man zoomed past me, running fast, going downhill. There's a cliff right there, trees on this side. He jumped over the cliff, ran into the tree, broke a bunch of branches, fell down, scratches, blood everywhere. And then he came out and he's like, why didn't you stop me? I didn't know you were, you were he said, I was going too fast, I couldn't stop, I lost control. And it was fun and everybody laughed at him and everything. But subhanAllah, as I was driving, I was thinking about this, just smiling. And then it hit, there's a deep metaphor here. There's a deep metaphor here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He described desires, temptations as something that pulls you. And when you're going downhill, there's gravity that's pulling you. And if you don't stop yourself, you don't walk carefully, you don't put some effort to slow yourself down, what happens? You speed up. You go faster and faster and faster. And if you go faster and faster and faster, you will come to a certain point where your muscles, your legs, as strong as you might be, are no longer strong enough to stop you because you're just going too fast. And if you have friends like me who just moves out and you go boom, right? You're in trouble because there's nobody there to stop you. And in that situation, the person that stops, you know, in order for them to stop, there have to be a big crash, a big event. Something that's going to wake them up. And there are people who, who go into their temptation and desires and they follow one after the other after the other until what happens, they start to seek him out. And you know, kids, young teenagers, they go to school, they're friends. Hey, why don't you try this? Well, what is this? Hey, just try it. You won't go to hellfire for doing it once. Right? They offer drugs, marijuana, drug, alcohol, all of these things. Then these friends, and these friends, may Allah protect us from friends like this. They ruin people's lives. And I'm telling you, every single person that has a bad habit, think about when it started, how it started. Usually it goes back to a friend that offered it to that person. <coughs> and so, you know, there are people that get stuck like this. And then it's like the friend that pushes you downhill. And as you start going, what happens? One time, two times, three times, peer pressure. You start doing it one, two, or three, uh, three, four times, four times. And then what happens? The desire, naturally by its pull, it starts to take over. So next time the person sees that bottle of alcohol, he can't control himself. Next time they see that drug, they can't con then they just start going out seeking it. And addiction is a serious problem that is facing this ummah at this day and age. It's one of the fitan that is, that is unheard of. 
that, that it's coming at such a rapid rate stage and it's being advertised and, and all of these things that are harmful is being displayed in front of the people and there are hearts that's drinking it up. And I'm not just talking about substances. There are people addicted to Netflix. There are people addicted to video games. There are people addicted to TV shows. I mean, everything in this world that we're living in at this time, they have addictive nature that, that is being pulled. And so, if you have people in your life that is good people, not like me who moved out of the way of the friend, if there are people that is going to help you, there will be people that will say, look, you're going too fast, slow down. They will maybe bump into you and stop you. Maybe you don't like them because it kills the joy of going down really fast. But they are trying to help. They are trying to help. And you have to let them help you. And there are people, they will not be helped. They want to crash. And one of the trees that people can crash into, Allah describes it in the Quran, Shajaratu Zakum. And it's a tree in hellfire that comes from the depths of hellfire. He says, Talwaha ka'annahu ru'usu shayateen. Its fruits are like the heads of devils. You know, and then this, this path of addiction, this path of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, all of these things, it has consequence. It has a consequence. Somebody going through their life, you know, you won't believe this. A person called me up a couple of years ago. They said, you know, I heard you work with youth. I said, yes. Okay, can you talk to my kids, please? I said, what's going on, brother? He said, you know, they don't respect me. They don't, they don't do anything. They go to school. They do this, they do that. And he had a lot of complaints about his kids. I said, okay, I'll come over. I went to his house. Teenagers. Inna lillahi wa inna rajoon. He's sitting like this. Okay, what are you going to tell me? Right, look at you. Is this guy going to tell me something? So he sat down, started talking to him. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me to say some things that affected this, this youth. After some time, he was sitting like this, then he was like this, paying attention. So he got to start getting interested, and the parents are sitting there, they're like, ah, oh, it's working, right? So what happened? I'm talking to them, and the kids start opening up, start asking questions. My friends are offering me this and that in school. Uh, is, is it haram to smoke weed? Is it okay? I said, no, it's haram. You know, it's, it's, I mean, unless it's for medicinal reason and everything, I quoted the fatwas that were out about it, and I started explaining to them the word khamar, the how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes intoxicants in the Quran. I said alcohol, cocaine, heroin, magic mushrooms, uh, PCP, methamphetamines, all of them, these are things that is not allowed in Islam. And if you go into that, it's not permissible, you're, you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I was going through the list, and I hit the word alcohol, the parents were like, uh, uh, Brother Shwab, can we speak to you for a second? I said, yeah, sure. They pulled me outside. I said, I understand drugs are haram, but beer is not haram, right? I said, you mean root beer? <laughs> said, no, 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 beer. Said, not all the time, not all the time. Well, like once in a while in a weekend. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you want me to talk to your kids? You, you, you drink it in front of them? They're like, yeah, it's, it's just you know, him and his wife together. And subhanAllah, you know, this is, if, if, if you're wondering, you know, how are we going to protect our kids from these things? We have to help ourselves. If you want to grow trees of Medina in your house, you have to create the environment of Medina. In the environment of, environment of Medina, it has the, the, the presence of the prophetic Sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It has the presence of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you don't have his Sunnah in your life, and you're going around disobeying Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and the kids are watching, and they grow up, and they're doing things, you can't say, why this or why that? You started it. You started it. And you have to be very, very careful, especially raising kids in this country, in this time and age that we're living in. No matter where you are now, it's difficult. <coughs> it's not like before. My parents told me when we were kids, they would just let us go outside. Our neighbors would teach us Islam. Our uncles would come over and teach us. If we do something wrong, the neighbor would grab us by the ear, bring us to our parents. Oh, you know what I saw your son doing? You know, don't do that. Not good. Now you let your kids out. You know what happens? Finished. You lose them. And so it's, it's a serious time that we're living in. And the, the major fitan that's, that's facing our youth, one of these problems, alcohol. The Prophet ﷺ said, you know, whoever plants it, whoever picks it, whoever presses it, whoever buys it, whoever sells it, whoever carries it, whoever drinks it, whoever sits with those who are drinking it, all of them have the curse of Allah coming down on them. And so if you have a family member, Muslims, mashallah, they invite you to their house and they're serving alcohol, don't sit with them at that occasion. Go away because the curse is coming down, you don't want any part of it. And what does the curse mean? The scholars have said, if you happen to be in a situation where the curse, the Prophet ﷺ described that the curse is there, he said it can do a few things. 
If you have good deeds, it will take away your good deeds. Not maybe all at once, but as the curse is there and you're sitting there, it's removing good deed, good deed, good deed, good deed. Right? Like in, in, in video games, you have the poison effect, you keep losing HP. That's what happens. And, or, or, or he said, if you have no good deeds, then it starts to inflict damage to you. You start to gain bad deeds just by sitting there. Maybe you're not drinking. Maybe you're not partaking in this, in this haram activity that they're doing. But you're sitting there and they're drinking and you're just sitting and laughing. And, and you're getting bad deeds. Or if, you're, if you have bad deeds and you have no good deeds, then the bad deeds start to multiply. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from being the accursed people. You know, when that brother said, you know, is beer okay? I said, Budweiser, haram. Jack Daniels, also haram. <laughs> Uh, martinis with, with other mixtures in it, also haram. It started going one by one, I said, okay, okay, I get the point. Never called me again. <laughs> Never called me again. So, thing with temptations is like this. There are people who try to help you. If you have an addiction, you don't like to hear from them. It's, it's normal. A kid that's addicted to their video games, the parents say, hey, <coughs> Abdullah! Allah, I'm the middle of a game. Abdullah! And, okay, fine. What do you want? Right? They don't like to be broken out of their trance. But you know it's for their own good. If you have family members struggling with this, help them. If you're struggling with this, help your, have, let your family members help you. If you need help, go. There's uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, all these different programs to help people get over these kind of addictions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. <laughs> and so, going back to our deen and talking about Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He lived in a time. A lot of people don't know this, but alcohol and its use was very rampant. In fact, some of the Sahaba they said about Omar, for example, they said if it wasn't for Omar, if it wasn't for Islam, Omar would probably die from alcohol overdose. This was the situation. They had bars, they had over 20, 30 different names for the, the khamr that they used to drink. And what happened in the first 13 years, revelations coming down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't attack alcohol first. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started building up the iman of the people. He started talking to them about Jannah, he started talking to them about hellfire, about the day of judgment, about the accountability before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aisha radiallahu has said, if the first words that came down in the Quran were, don't drink alcohol, don't do zina, People would have said, we're never going to stop. But she said the first words came down was describing Allah and the day of judgment and everything until the hearts became attached and Iman starts to grow. And then the orders of halal and haram came down and the people were willing to, to, to abide by them. And so the reality is, there are a lot of people, they know alcohol is haram. It's not like they don't know. The family that said beer is not haram, show me in the Quran it's not haram, they know it's haram. I'm pretty sure they know it's haram. But the problem is, we don't reflect on the Day of Judgment, we don't reflect on the, on the, 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 the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough for it to affect our hearts. So what happens? The big haram things become very small in our eyes. And we tell each other, it's okay, one time is no problem. Yeah, it's once a week is no problem. Once a month is no problem. Once a day is no problem. At least I'm not killing anybody. And the guy who killed somebody said, well, at least I didn't kill 10 people. And the guy who killed 10 people said, at least I'm not Hitler. I mean, look at what he did. Right? And we always can justify away whatever thing it is by looking at somebody that did worse than us. But the Sahaba said to the Tabi'een saying, you look at your sins as something insignificant. In our time, he said, we used to look at them as mountains that would crumble on us and would kill us. He said, you, you consider some things to be small and insignificant. We would be terrified that because of this, Allah might cause the earth to swallow us. And so we have to go back to the understanding, not how small the sin is, but how major it is that we're disobeying the one who created us. How big it is that the one who controls the heavens and the earth, and this little creature here on earth, we have the audacity to say, you know what, I'll do whatever I want, I don't want to listen to you. This is a serious matter. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to overcome these issues. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our children, protect our families. Ya Allah, ya Rahman, ya Rahim. 
Anyone struggling, Ya Allah, we ask you to grant us ease, Ya Allah. Anyone going through difficulties, Ya Allah, we ask you to grant us ease, Ya Allah. And open the paths of goodness for us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, anyone going through difficulties in their, in their Iman, Ya Allah, in their Deen, Ya Allah, we ask you to increase our Iman, Ya Allah. Make us from the people who established the prayer, Ya Allah. Make us from the people who are protected from the waswasa, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Anyone going through difficulties in their families, unite our hearts, Ya Allah. Purify us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, bring us together, Ya Allah. There is nobody that can Bring the hearts together except you, Ya Allah. Anyone go through difficulties in their financial affairs, Ya Allah. Provide for us halal and tayyib rizq, Ya Allah. And protect us from being among the cursed people, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, we ask you. You're the one who knows us deep inside our hearts, Ya Allah. If there is anything wrong in our hearts, Ya Allah, help us overcome these evils, Ya Allah. Protect us from the evil that is within our hearts, Ya Allah. And we ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, make us amongst those who hear the truth and follow it, Ya Allah. And grant us the rizq and show us the truth as the truth, Ya Allah. And show us the falsehood as falsehood, Ya Allah. And enter us into Jannah hand in hand with our families, Ya Allah. Let us drink from the hands of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A drink after which there is, there is no thirst, Ya Allah. And we ask you, protect us from drinks that are displeasing to you, Ya Allah. Protect us from, from things that are displeasing to you, Ya Allah. Any action that brings us closer to hellfire, protect us and our loved ones from that, Ya Allah. And we ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, protect us from hellfire and accept our du'as, Ya Allah. And forgive us, Ya Allah. Forgive us. You're the one who forgives all sins. And you have said, Ya O son of Adam, if you come to me with sins as high as mountains and ask forgiveness of me, <coughs> I'll match it with equal forgiveness. So forgive all of us, Ya Allah. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Qimus salaf.